And Isaiah 57 is where we're going to start this morning. Isaiah 57, 15. We're going to read, uh, or actually the, the topic is called God has no time limit. Every day is a new day. So uh, we will go from there. <clears throat> Isaiah 57, 15. We read, for thus says the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, when you have written letters and you've had letters of introduction, how many of you have opened with this as, you know, as here, this is who I am. Uh, by the way, I'm the high, I'm the exalted and lofty one. And by the way, I inhabit eternity. Okay, probably none of us should. Uh, if we do, then there's something wrong. But God inhabits eternity. I don't know how big that is. But it's big, you know, <laughs> inhabiting eternity. So does that make him in charge? I don't think he's an extra for all eternity. I think he's in charge of all eternity. For thus says the exalted and lofty one that inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. By the way, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also, that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. So, uh, if we're going to be talking about time limits, how about inheriting eternity? Okay, go to Second Peter. We're going to see some everlasting truths here this morning. Second Peter three, and then we'll pick it up in verse seven, because Second Peter three seven tells us, "But the heavens and the earth which are now." Okay, this is what we're living in and on. The heavens and the earth which are now, by the same word, are kept in store. They're reserved under fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So why are they going to be destroyed? Well, there's going to be fire. Now, you can speculate all you want from it being hit by an asteroid to nuclear warfare to global warming, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's been reserved under fire. Why? Against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. All right. But verse 8 says, but beloved, don't be stupid. Uh, <clears throat> be not ignorant or don't overlook this or um, don't let this escape your notice. I like that translation. But beloved, God is calling us beloved. Don't let this escape your notice. It's something you ought to know that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. In a thousand years is one day. This helps us to understand God has no calendar, okay? One day is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like one day. God doesn't sleep. So he doesn't need to be refreshed. You don't need to ring a bell to wake him up. So this puts it in a great perspective. Again, God has no time limit. One day is like a thousand years. Why, though? Verse 9, because the Lord, the Lord is not slack, okay? I'll read you the working translation. The Lord is not delaying the promise, as some consider it a delay. Oh, everything's been going on since, you know, forever. It's the same stuff over and over again. Well, no, but, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to make God less than he is and less powerful. The Lord is not delaying the promise, as some consider it a delay. But he is long-suffering towards you. i got to read that again. I always like that part. God is long suffering towards us, yea, not wanting any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Okay, God's heart is He wants as many children for all eternity as possible. So, yeah, He's delaying some things. We would have loved to have had Him come back, but if He came back, you know, say five years ago, my two grandchildren wouldn't be wouldn't be around. So, you know, I'm glad God delays it. Oh, by the way, uh, Mr. Peoples is going to be a father. So uh, his wife is due in uh, May. Uh, he made the official uh, official announcement, so it's official. So anyway, the point is, is that I don't mind God delaying because if we're on his timetable, his time limit. He wants people. He likes people. He loves people. He sent his son to die for people. So he doesn't want any to perish. He wants everybody to come to repentance. Uh, so, yeah, we have to be patient. Okay, go to Psalm 90. We, we also notice that God is pretty patient too. 
God is, you know, very long suffering. I kind of like that translation better than patient. <laughs> He's long suffering because, you know, if you're patient, sometimes you're suffering. But right. Psalm 90, verse 1. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. This is, you know, a psalm. Uh, and basically, uh, we're a couple thousand years later, and God is still our dwelling place in all generations. You know, before the mountains were brought forth, wherever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you're still God. You know, you didn't just kind of, uh, you know, everything appear and then you appeared. No, it, didn't, it doesn't work that way. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Thou turns man to, well, the word is dust. Thou turneth man to dust, right? He told Adam that's what's going to happen. Dust you are, dust you're going to return. That happens with all of us. So he says, return you children of men. The children of men are going to all return to dust. But again, for a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past. And as a watch in the night. So, you know, one night, one watch in the night, the three, four hour time frame of a watch in the night. Or like, you know, yesterday being past, a thousand years could go by. It doesn't matter to God. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past. And as a watch in the night, you uh, sweep them away as with a flood. They are uh, they are as a dream in the morning. They are like grass which grows up in the morning. It flourishes, grows up in the evening. Time to break out the lawnmower and just wither away. So this gives you an idea, again, more information about God. So verse 12 says, so what should we do about it? So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom, or that we may get a heart of wisdom. That's how uh, it reads from the Hebrew text. Teach us to number our days. Teach us to think about each day so that we can apply our heart, so that we can get a heart of wisdom. You know. Uh, there's there's an old saying that when you're uh, when you're young, say 20 years old, if you're not a liberal, you don't have a heart. And then at 40, if you're not a conservative, you don't have a brain. So as we've gotten older, we gather more wisdom about God, about life, about things like that. And we don't follow our emotions and follow our heart. We start realizing logically what life's really about. And it's about God, it's about Jesus Christ, it's about Holy Spirit. And th th those are the great things that continue on. That's what we're to be aware of, okay? So God, teach us. We're ready to learn. All right, now let's go to Lamentations. This is probably many of your favorite book of the Bible. We're going to go to Lamentations 3. I'm going to talk about Lamentations here more in a moment, but I want to read Lamentations 3.22, and then I'm going to talk about who's lamenting. Um, so Lamentations 3.22. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new or they are fresh every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. That sounds like a great song. Great is thy faithfulness. Uh, but every morning we have fresh compassions, fresh mercies. Every morning. Or if you don't get up till the afternoon, every afternoon. It's a new day. It's a fresh day. Uh, see, let me read you uh, the English Standard Version of these two verses. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. They're new every morning. Claim, claim them this morning. Claim them each day. These are what, these are ours. You know, new mercies. Yay, every morning. You talk about being able to start the day over again. You know, this isn't Groundhog Day where you keep living the same day over and over again or 51st dates, you know, one of those type of things. Every morning we get up, we can start afresh. We got a whole new day of, of enjoying the things of God. I go to Lamentations 1 1. Let me tell um, the actual title of this book is the very first word. This word, how, in Lamentations 1 1. These are the Lamentations of Jeremiah. 
those of you who were online online a couple of weeks ago when we saw uh, what happened with Jeremiah when they said I don't mean uh, when they said hey uh, ask God for us what we should do and then he told them and they says no you're lying okay so uh, then they took him into captivity this is his lamentations this is his trials uh, it's also translated as tears these are his tears okay but the the title of the book is the very first word this word uh how it's uh, a hebrew word that means alas alas it's a cry of pain it's an exclamation of, of pain and grief it's a wailing cry alas well jeremiah look jerusalem had been invaded by the babylonians this is a, at least five times backed over they'd come and they'd taken everything Burnt, burnt things took all the people away anything of value they kept coming back and taking more they didn't have people cross the border they went and got those people and brought them all back to babylon okay so here they are and now here's jeremiah one of the few that are left and he's lamenting okay it's alas pain grief wailing lamentations this book describes the view the funeral of a city a once proud thriving jerusalem has been reduced to rubble in 586 bc like i said it kept getting plundered and now here's jeremiah who was there and you know uh and that it would that was there and lived through it all and then he's lamenting oh my god so let's read verse one what we'll one to one one to five how does the city sit solitary that was full of people how has she become as a widow she that was great among the nations and princess among the provinces how has she become a tributary you know so how, we're just slaves we're just we're like the white Sox in the 70s kept getting good players and the yankees would take them they were like a farm team a tributary to the yankees because uh, they didn't have any money in their ownership well that's what he's talking about here how has she become a tributary how has she become slaves she weeps bitterly in the night. Her tears are on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she has none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They, they are become her enemies. Judah has gone into captivity. Judah has gone into exile because of affliction, because of great or greater heart, and because of hard servitude. She dwells among the other nations. Remember, they were separated out from the heathen, from the other nations. But now they just dwell amongst all the other nations. She finds no rest. All her persecutors overtook her between the straits, which means all of her persecutors overtook her in the midst of her distress. In the midst of her distress, everybody else came in to plunder her. The ways of Zion, the roads to Zion do mourn because none come to the solemn feast remember they're supposed to come to jerusalem three three times a year for the feast nobody's coming to the feast anymore all the roads are empty nobody's coming to the solemn feast all her gates are desolate her priests sigh her virgins are afflicted she's in bitterness her adversaries are the head are the chief or the head her adversaries are the top people from other nations her enemies prosper for the Lord hath afflicted her for the multitude of her transgressions. Her children have gone into captivity. They're going gone away as captives before the enemy, right? Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, Abednego, Ezekiel. Uh, uh, you know, they're all gone. They were all taken into captivity. Uh, that kind of makes you sad because there was a great thriving, you know, a few hundred years before that with David and Solomon, it was one of the most beautiful places in the world. And then because of their allowing iniquity and ungodliness to live, this is what happened. And Jeremiah in tears is lamenting and wailing and crying on behalf of the people. But, you know, go to Psalm 100. What does God say though? In Philippians 4, 4, he tells us to rejoice in the Lord always. Well, we can rejoice. Jeremiah could rejoice in the fact that he knew the Savior was going to come and that Israel was going to come back from the Babylonian captivity. Psalm 100, verse 5. 
So we can continue to rejoice and rejoice in the Lord always. So there's a limit on our rejoicing, and that limit is always. Psalm 100, verse 5. Some of you all familiar with? Maybe we should sing this verse. Psalm 100, verse 5. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth or his faithfulness endures to all generations. God's faithfulness endures to our generation. And if the Lord tarries the next generation, God's mercy is everlasting because the Lord is good. The Lord is good. So I love reading everlasting mercy, faithfulness to all generations. Uh, while we're in Psalms, let's look at some more. Psalm 23. Psalm 23, verse 6. I looked at 22.6, and that's really bad. 22.6 is, but I am a worm. No, that's not what I want. Psalm 23, verse 6. Surely, goodness and mercy, or loving kindness here, surely goodness and loving kindness shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Again, talking about David, but it's very true today because we can't lose spirit. We can dwell with the gift of Holy Spirit in us all the time, only for ever, forever. Goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. It will pursue me. It will track me down, God's goodness and mercy. That's how good it is. God sends it out to chase you down. You're going to have goodness and mercy, whether you like it or not. That's what's available for his people today. Look at... Um, uh, Psalm 33, 11. Psalm 33, 11 tells us, the counsel of the Lord stands forever. Again, I love to see that forever part. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The thoughts of his heart to all generations. Okay, the word thoughts, there's plans. The counsel of the Lord stands forever, and the plans of the heart of God's heart to all generations. God's got a plan, and it's a good plan, and he'll give us counsel along the way. So because of that, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he has chosen for his inheritance. We can be blessed as we continue to move ahead. Look at Psalm 107. Psalm 107, 19. All right, Psalm 107, 19. <clears throat> okay. Okay, uh, Psalm 107, 19. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble. They, they, they list the different troubles, but here's the key. They cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saves them out of their distresses. He rescues them. God rescues his people out of their distresses. He sent his word, and his word healed them and rescued them from the grave. His destructions there, from danger, from the grave. He sent his word. His word healed them and rescued them from the grave, from the danger, from the destructions. And then verse 21 should be our honest reaction to it. Oh, that men would praise. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness. And for his wonderful works to the children of men or for humankind. We should praise or give thanks to the Lord for his goodness. We just saw his goodness is him being good forever and for his wonderful works. God's got a lot of wonderful works. Man, just walk outside and look around. Uh, beautiful, wonderful works. Give thanks for the things of God. All right, back to Isaiah. We've run through Psalm, uh, the book of Psalms. Now we'll look at a few verses in Isaiah 46. Isaiah 46, we'll look at a few verses in Isaiah that talk about how big God is and uh, God not being in a hurry or in the time constraints. Uh, you know, the clock's not just going to go off one day and guy, oh, that's it. It's part of his plan. Psalm 46, 9. Remember the former things of old. 
Hey, some of us are getting to the point where we're, this this speaks loudly to us, right? Remember the former things of old. <laughs> For I am God, and there is none else. I am God. There's none like me. Hello. There's nobody, there's not even a close second. All right. This is our Father. Uh, in in uh, the manifestations, uh, Fred basically just, you know, said this, you know. I'm the almighty God. You know, I'm the almighty God. I'm your father, but I'm also the almighty God. You know, I'm your father, but I'm not, you know, I'm a strong almighty God. I'm a strong father. I can take care of my people. So remember that. Remember that I am your God. Nobody else, none like me. In fact, I could declare the end from the beginning. I always read that and I think, God, it's terrible watching a movie with God. He, you know, he tells you what's going to happen, you know, before it starts. <laughs> Declaring the end from the beginning, from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. He kind of has a grasp of what's going on. My counsel, my purpose is going to stand. And I will do all my pleasure. What it what pleases me, I'm going to do it. I've got a plan. I've got a purpose. If I need to call a ravenous bird from the east, there goes the bird. If I need to have a man that will execute my counsel, from a far country. Yep, I can do that. Look, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. Okay? So basically, God, we're part of God's plan. We're part of the, the body of Christ. He has a purpose for all of us today. So do that part. And don't be overly concerned about tomorrow. We've got plenty to do today. All right? Uh, look at the. Uh, you know, again, verse 10 just told us, I will accomplish all my purpose. It's not a 50-50. It's going to happen. And verse 11 said, I have purposed. I'm, I will do it. All right? And we've read the end of the book. It's really good. Go to Isaiah 51. Go over a couple of pages. 51.6. 51.6 tells us, lift up your eyes to the heavens. Look upon the earth beneath. We're seated in heavenly, so we could do this. And the heavens shall vanish away like smoke. The earth shall wax old like a garment. And they that dwell therein shall die in like manner. But my salvation shall be forever. And my righteousness shall not be abolished. Look at that. The, the old earth is going to wax old like a garment. It's going to go out of style. The new earth will be something, right? They that dwell therein, they're all going to die. Uh, but the resurrection of just, the gathering together. So remember, just again, what is the, the word talks about stuff like this in many places. So we just need to understand it and to keep moving. God, is, look at uh, Isaiah 60. Isaiah 60, verse 19, 6019. Okay, you ready? The sun shall no more thy light by day. The sun shall be no more thy light by day. Neither for the brightness shall the moon give light unto thee. Okay? So the sun and the moon are going to be obsolete. But the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light, and thy God thy glory. The glory of the Lord is going to be so strong, we won't need a sun. And it's an everlasting light. The sun's going to have a be a supernova and blow up. Who knows? But the point is, is that we have an everlasting light. God, he's in our everlasting light. Verse 20 says again, the sun shall no more go down, neither shall the moon withdraw itself. For the Lord shall be thy everlasting light, and the days of thy morning shall be ended. What's it going to be like just to be happy for all eternity? Well, that'll be great. <laughs> no morning anymore. Won't be there. All right. Uh, Isaiah 55. We'll look at one more in Isaiah, uh, and then we'll move to the New Testament. Isaiah 55, verse 6. All right. <clears throat> Isaiah 55, 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him, because he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way, 
in the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for our God, who is waiting patiently, because one year is like a thousand years, he will abundantly pardon. The loving God. But as a reminder, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my way, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and returns not thither, but it waters the earth and makes it bring forth and sprout, that it may give seed to the it can give seed to the sower, bread to the eater. That's why God has all that to come down. Verse eleven: So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It's not going to come back to me empty. Instead, it's going to accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper, or it shall succeed in the thing whereto I sent it. Right? God's word, God's plan, God's purpose. God will prosper, succeed with his word to what he wants it to do. Verse 12, then, for you shall go out with joy. We're supposed to, you know, joy is a good thing. And be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing. And all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn, you're going to get uh, the cypress tree. Instead of the briar, you're going to have a myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. An everlasting sign. When all of this happens, it's all part of God's plan, God's purpose. Guess what? You're invited. When you speak in tongues, you know you're, you're there, and you'll have a great place for all eternity. Go to John 3.16. So, during Isaiah's time frame, he was trying to get the word across. Isaiah was a prophet for four kings. One of them, of course, was Hezekiah, who cleaned things up. Uh, but Hezekiah's son, Manasseh, probably had Isaiah executed. Meanwhile, back in John 3.16, we read, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Okay, the word of God interprets itself right where it's written. You you want everlasting life. That's what's available, available out of because of God's love. God loved whoever believes regarding the son they're not going to perish. They may die, but they won't perish because their spirit will come back and they will be uh, with them forever. But you get, you get everlasting life. Look at John 14. Everlasting life with a new spiritual body as he is. John 14, verse 1. So be really bummed out. Oh, no, wait a minute. Let not your heart be troubled. Oh. Let not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? Well, then believe in me. Believe in me, Jesus Christ, as your Lord. By the way, in my father's house are many mansions. I can imagine back in 1611 when the guys were translating this, <clears throat> they wanted to embellish this a little bit because it, it's translated as apartments or dwellings, but they decided to put mansions in there. Let's make it even bigger. God's got a mansion for everybody. Well, we don't have servants, so I don't want a big mansion. It'd be tough enough to clean. So, but we'll have a nice dwelling place, is what he's telling us. In my father's house are many dwellings. If it was not so, I would have told you. But you know what? I go to prepare a place for you. Now, this doesn't mean he's going to go be a carpenter and build all these dwelling places, okay? He's talking spiritually here. If I go, uh, verse 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you'll be also. For whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Okay. If I'm one of the 12 apostles, and he says that to me, I don't have a clue. I'm sorry. I'm glad Thomas speaks up here. I'm leaving. I'm going to go build you an apartment. I'm going to build you a beautiful mansion, a great dwelling place. Uh, and and uh, I'll come back and get you. But you already know the way. You know where I'm going. You're like, what? I would be. Thomas then says unto him, Lord, 
we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way if we don't know where you're going? You know? All right. And Jesus says unto him, obviously a very spiritual matter. He's taking it up. All right. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth, ye know him and have seen him. As you've seen the works that the Christ has done, you're going to get the Spirit from God. Uh, all of you will get it. But here it is. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the plan. Right? I'm the promised seed of the woman. I'm going to accomplish it. And then I'm going to leave. You're going to get the gift of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to be building a whole bunch of mansions. Maybe we're supposed to, that's why, maybe that's why we get gathered together first. We get to go try all those mansions out first, right? So you see what it's like? You know, we get to pick out our own ones. Yeah, probably not. Okay. We'll have something else to do. Acts 2. Acts 2, 37, day of Pentecost. Uh, they're speaking in tongues. People are wondering what the heck's going on. End of the, end of Peter talking. Acts 2, 37. When they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you, to your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. We have been called. We answered the call. The call is out there for everybody, but we answered the call. It's available then to believe and receive the Spirit for all eternity. This is continued, verse 38, for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off. Us, our children, our children's children, to our children's children's children. Old Moody Blues cover. Anyway, album. All right, so that's what's going on. First Thessalonians 5, that's what's available. That's been good for the last 2,000 years. That will change when Christ comes back. All right. We all are familiar with 1 Thessalonians 4. Uh, there'll be a trumpet uh, from the archangel. The dead in Christ is going to rise first. We're going to go to the clouds. We're going to have a giant party. 5 1, though. 1 Thessalonians 5 1 says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. If he would have told the apostles or the first century church that it was going to be at least 2,000 years later, how would they have lived their life knowing that it wasn't going to happen in their lifetime? That the hope was still way in the future. So God just told them, I don't know when. God does. We don't. But of the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child, but they shall not escape. And then he talks about good things for all of us. We drop down to verse 9, 5, 9. For God, though, has not appointed us to wrath. I love reading that. You have not, you don't have an appointment with the wrath. We're saved from the wrath to come. Instead, you have been appointed to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we're watching or sleeping, we shall be made alive together with him. Wherefore, comfort, encourage one another together, and edify one another, even as also you do. We don't know when he's coming, but we do know that he is coming. We are to be encouraged. And it's all because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's a big part of it. Go to 1 Corinthians 1. Because what should we be doing in the meantime while we're waiting for Christ to come back? Here's a novel idea. Talk to others about the Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.17. 1 Corinthians 1.17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Preach the good news about Jesus Christ. That's what we're to do, but we don't use the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. All right? For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. It's the power of God. 
For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Who? Where's the wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the disputer of this world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. We're really smart. We don't need God. <laughs> but it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. The foolishness of just believing that we needed a Savior, he came, and we are saved from the wrath. That's what we have. That's what we are to do. Jump down to verse 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Love that. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see, for you look at your calling. This is our calling. This is why we're part of the reason why we're alive today. This is your calling, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble born are called. All right. Not many of the powerful were called. But again, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak or meek things of the world to put to shame the things of the mighty. We're the low born, but we'll be exalted for all eternity. So we talk about the Christ. We praise God. We open our mouths. We talk and make it available for others to know him. Okay? So we, we're, we'll go to 2 Corinthians 2. We keep pressing. We keep moving. We press for the upward calling of the, you know, the high calling. 2 Corinthians 5, 9. Because of that, what should we do today? We labor. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be well-pleasing of him. And that's either present on earth or absent from the body, being in heaven. Because we want to be well-pleasing. That's why we renew our mind. Verse 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That's the reality that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done. Whether it's good or bad, there will be rewards for you done in love for all eternity. And you're going to be at the Bema. Like I've always said, you can't send your secretary, your wife, your kid. You got to go. Your chauffeur, okay? You have to be the one that will give an answer. Give an answer to God. So we're going to close. In Ecclesiastes 9, actually, let me rephrase it. We're going to close in the book of Ecclesiastes. We'll start with chapter 9. So I'm going to read from Ecclesiastes 9.1 from the English Standard Bible. Okay? <clears throat> Ecclesiastes 9.1, a reading by Jim Milton. But all this I laid to heart, examining it all. How the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hand of God. Whether it is love or hate, man does not know. Both are before him. It is the same for all, since the same event happens to the righteous and to the wicked, to the good and the evil, to the clean and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice. As the good one is, so is the sinner. And he who swears is as he who shuns an oath. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that the same event happens to all. Also, the hearts of the children of man are full of evil, and madness is in their hearts while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. But he who is joined with all the living has hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Their love and their hate and their envy have already perished. And forever they have no more share in all that is done under the sun. Well, if the Lord tears and we end up there, what should we do in the meantime? Well, we should preach about the Lord Jesus Christ. But also verse 7 tells us to go, live life, eat your bread with joy, drink your wine with a merry heart. For God has already approved what you do. Let your garments be always white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. 
Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, whatever your occupation is, whatever you need to do, do it with your might. For there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom and shield to which you are going. Again, I saw that under the sun, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those with knowledge. But time and chance happen to them all. For man does not know his time like fish that are taken in an evil net, like birds that are caught in a snare. So the children of man are snared at an evil time when it suddenly falls upon them. We don't know when, but we don't know when Christ is coming back. Hopefully that'll happen first. But if not, I right, go to 11.5. On the way to 12, we stop at 11.5. To read an interesting verse. Ecclesiastes 11.5, English Standard Version. As you do not know the way the spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a woman with child, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. Go ahead, explain how God put it all together. You don't know the work of, of God who makes everything. So, in conclusion, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Throughout the 12 chapters, he's gone back and forth explaining a lot of different things that he has seen. So here's the end of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And our duty in our administration is to tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. So we are called according to God's purpose. We can continue to live for him today. We can teach others about the Christ. We can praise God and then enjoy life as we wait for the Christ to come back.